Hey everyone, welcome to week two of our Ephesians study. As you may already know, today we're covering Ephesians 2, so follow along if you have your Bibles. This chapter is packed with Christian doctrine as it includes many crucial aspects of our faith from a more zoomed out perspective, all within 22 verses. The point of focus Paul is trying to get us to understand is that we have renewed lives in Christ. So what does this mean? The first thing Paul wants us to discover about having renewed lives in Christ is that salvation comes by grace alone through faith. This idea is emphasized right from the beginning of Ephesians 2. The first three verses use words like dead, under wrath, and enslaved to describe each and every one of us before being made alive in Christ. Verse four, however, introduces the solution to the problems that verses one through three present. We see two of the most powerful words in the Bible at this point, but God. We were dead in our sin, but God, because of his grace, love, and mercy for us, has made us alive together in Christ. Paul then emphasizes in verses five and eight that it is by the grace of God that this is even possible. It isn't a work of our own doing. God is laying out his formula for rescuing his people. We see that his rich mercy, his great love, and his grace all come together to produce the free gift of salvation, which is received through faith. Every aspect of salvation and renewal that we see from Paul in this chapter, besides the act of receiving it, has absolutely nothing to do with our own actions or characteristics. We are entitled or deserving of the type of love God offers. Even when we're dead in our trespasses, he loved us, not because we're deserving of it, but simply because of who God is. Verses eight and nine go further to say that grace is a gift, not a result of works so that no man can boast. When we're saved, we have nothing to brag about other than the God who makes it all possible. Not only are we saved from wrath, sin, and death, but we're made into his workmanship. This translates in Greek to the word poema. The idea here is that we are his beautiful poem his beautiful work of art, his masterpiece. This is possible because God's love is a transforming love. It takes us as we are and doesn't improve upon who we were, but instead makes us completely new. And while our actions do not play a part in us receiving our salvation, they are evidence of Christ in us. And we should live in a way that represents the faith that we claim. The second point is that we are created for good works as a part of the renewed life we have in Christ. There is a very important distinction being made here by Paul. Paul says that we're created in Jesus for our works, not by our works. Our own actions aren't what get us saved, but that doesn't mean that how we act isn't important. Good works in Christ are a natural result of a genuine relationship with him. All the way back in verse two, we see that trespasses and sins are the way that we once walked. Now that we're made alive in Christ, we still sin, but will not walk in sin. Walking conveys this attitude of everyday comfort and normalcy. If we're walking in sin, then it's a part of our day-to-day -day life, and frankly, not something that we think we need to get away from. We should be running desperately away from sin, and instead towards Jesus. The other clear distinction that Paul makes is that we are saved for good works, not just from bad ones. You'll find if you ask a group of people if they would consider themselves a good person, many of them would simply list out the bad things that they don't do. We can get to a place where we think that avoiding the bad actually makes us good. But remember, we're not just to run from sin, but towards Jesus. As followers of Jesus experiencing renewed life, we're to chase after what's good. If we've been made new in Christ, this type of attitude should be reflected not just among us individually, but as the entire body of Christ. 
The final thing about the renewed life is that it creates the ultimate source of unity, unity in Christ. Unity is not a word that we would use to describe society when Paul was writing the epistles. There were a lot of barriers between different nationalities and cultures. The one Paul mentions the most is the tension between the Jews and the Gentiles. It's hard for us here in the 21st century in America to imagine what this type of segregation would have been like. In verse 14, Paul mentions how Christ has made us united and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Yes, this is likely referring mostly to the metaphorical wall between the opposing people groups, but there actually was a physical wall present in the temple in Jerusalem that was meant to keep the Gentiles out of the portion of the temple that only the Jews were permitted to enter. It's believed that the reason Paul was under house arrest when he was writing the book of Ephesians was because he was falsely accused of taking a Gentile past the temple's walls of separation. So yes, there was a great divide between these people groups, both metaphorical and literal, with the wall in the temple being one of the many examples there. But the point of emphasis here is that these walls are now a thing of the past. They've been broken down by the unifying act of Jesus' love for all people. In unifying us, Jesus isn't just making us all the same. He's making every one of us new. It's easy to think that Jesus' actions simply brought the Gentiles to the same level as the Jews, being that they were God's people, and the gospel makes it so the rest of the world is now included in this. But in reality, all people are made completely new. An early church author gives this helpful illustration. It's not that Christ has brought one up to the level of the other, but he has produced a greater, as if one should melt down one statue of silver and another of lead, and the two come together should come out as gold. Christ's unifying of all people creates a new race, as Christ early Christians called it, which included anyone who was in Jesus. So, when you read Ephesians 2, look for the three aspects of the renewed life in Christ. We go from being dead in our sin to having a renewed life in Christ because we obtain salvation by grace through faith alone. We are created in Christ for good works, not saved by our works. We are given the opportunity to glorify God by putting Jesus first in all that we do. And we're unified in Christ because of what he has done for each and every one of us. I hope you found this video helpful as you discover, learn, and apply this chapter to your life. Enjoy the rest of your study through the book of Ephesians.